Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Robin Scott. I'm co-founder and CEO of Apolitical, which is a global learning platform for government. And I'm delighted to welcome you all here today um, to this discussion, this very important discussion on how architecture could, can bring us together. And I'm grateful to the OECD for convening it in a room where one feels a bit more together than one often does in panel sessions. We're going to kick off immediately before hearing from any of our wonderful panelists uh, with a video which hopefully will show the potential of what architecture can do. Como uma grande artéria de acesso a São Paulo, bem transitado nos dias de semana. E no domingo, quando a gente vê lá fechada, transitando pessoas, é muito legal. Você começa a reparar nos prédios, na sala, na arquitetura. É muito legal esse espaço. Minhocão, construído aí há mais de 40 anos. E a ideia era que ele fosse uma alternativa a esse trânsito caótico aqui no centro de São Paulo. Quando você mora aqui na região, ela, ele muda um pouco de figura, porque ele passa a ser esse estorvo de, de realmente de barulho, de poluição. Vamos dar uma volta em cima aí. Brasil vem criança, vem todo mundo, fica aí. Os caras fazem até piquenique aí em cima. Para lá, bebendo lá em cima, cerveja, gelada, churrasco. É legal. Não tem um ponto de lazer grande assim, então eles aproveitam o minhocão de cabo a rabo. Nossa praia, né? nosso lazer. Para mim, minhoca significa a expressão artística e liberdade. Minhocão é um concreto orgânico. Para mim, é um momento de lazer que eu tiro para curtir com os amigos, com descontração, faz... a gente gosta de música. Então a gente se marca para se encontrar aqui, para bater resenha e fazer um som com a galera aí. Para mim, o minhocão é liberdade. Para mim, o minhocão é oportunidade e recriação. Então é um encontro de diversidade, onde a gente encontra todo tipo de gente, sem discriminação. E espero que aqui seja o nosso lazer definitivo, né? Você transformou uma coisa que foi um completo erro, assim, a coisa mais desastrosa que pode ter ocorrido nessa parte da cidade, que desvalorizou tudo, que caiu de uma forma absurda, para que pelo menos as pessoas, então, tenham um, um alívio, um respiro no final de semana, né? De uma construção egoísta para um espaço para todo mundo. Eu acho que é esse o meu cão de hoje. Didier, and we're going to hear from Didier shortly on a little bit more about how that um, came together. So our distinguished panelists uh, this afternoon, one of whom is missing but shortly arriving, um, architecture in her case hasn't brought us together quickly. Um, we have Anna, the Deputy Mayor of Toronto, um, Raphael, Trend Scout, um, the Future of Work from Vitra. Um, Anna, um, another Anna, read in architecture um, at the University of East London, and um, Matas, the mayor of Bratislava. Um, before turning to them, we've got quite a long session and we want audience participation throughout, and I'd like to kick off in that spirit. So just a, um, a few quick polls. 
we have um, a technological way of sharing feedback. Um, and please send questions and comments throughout the session. But right now, we're just going to start with a show of hands. Who, who feels here that in the, whatever city they live in, that architecture does enough to bring people together? Maybe two hands. Um, who feels that technology has made us more connected? Again, a couple of hands, okay, May maybe 10% maybe of the room. Um, it was very interesting in a session this morning on a new societal contract. Um, someone put forward the idea that human beings need three things. Um, they need autonomy, mastery, and connectedness. And we polled the audience on which of those three things is most critically missing at the moment. And overwhelmingly, it was an absence of connectedness. So clearly, architecture has that potential to bring us together. Um, and clearly, we need to do more to realize the potential. So we're going to kick off with a, um, a question about what's actually happening, what are some of the bright spots, and then we'll get into the impediments to having more of those and um, the, the, the solutions for change. So, um, Anna, would you kick us off with an example of what is, uh, what's working well in your city in Toronto? Can I give you two? Please yeah. give it two. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to give you two. One very local the, in the community that I represent, which is almost similar to the video. Uh, we are surrounded by uh, train tracks. And train tracks that kind of always felt like they were isolating that community. And what uh, was done was actually uh, uh, a rail path was built uh, for pedestrians, for cyclists, so uh, for people just to jog and it's a linear park that we have uh, and it's called the West Toronto Rail Path and I think is very very often used on how do we uh, use spaces uh, that sometimes are unused and how do we in a meaningful way bring people together from you know the neighborhoods and create a new public space uh, in the area. The other one is actually a policy uh, a pr uh, 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 piece of, of work that we just approved uh, in Toronto, which is growing up vertical. So every developer that now builds uh, the, in the city of Toronto has guidelines because, uh, you know, Toronto, uh, as much as it's a big urban center, 75% of our population uh, is still in, uh, you know, uh, very low neighborhoods. 75% uh, of the city has two floors and, and lower. And then we have now these very, very high rises that lately, you know, you had over 140,000 units built between 206 and 216. And families started to being raised in, 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 in those condos. And back in the day when we started to have condos, a lot of people didn't realize that these were uh, spaces where families were going to be. So we started to put in the guidelines um, Rooms to, to keep your strollers. Room, you know, how do you, how do you accommodate for families and how do you create, how do you design guidelines that actually have families? How do you create, maybe you don't need uh, a, a big pool room but for, for the parents or, or youth, but maybe you need also to have the playroom for the children or, or a space where children can, uh, can have activities. Uh, a playground. Can you have in your uh, outdoor amenities uh, playgrounds? So uh, these are some of the guidelines that, uh, that uh, we've been able, it's called growing up uh, uh, vertical. And I think it's, it's, it shows clearly how by design you can actually bring people together living in community, both in, in, the, in the context of West Toronto Rail Path dealing with our public spaces, but I think that also uh, governments and the private sector need to have these things as they uh, produce guidelines uh, for the private development as well. Super, thank you. Um, Mattis, you, had a, you were giving us a great example in our preparation session. Uh, yeah, I have actually two example, uh, examples. One is a more than, than is a symbolic gesture, but it's about, uh, about connectivity as well. Uh, maybe you know that that we maybe you know it's, we are having a world championship of ice hockey right now in my city in Bratislava, and I, I as a mayor, the the city is owning the main stadium, 
And as a mayor, I have a skybox, which is the best 18 places in the stadium. And I decided to give them to, to people who from Bratislava. So we are mixing, uh, we are giving tickets to children from bad, bad neighborhood to, and uh, uh, mixing uh, them with uh, our employees and, and giving this, this kind of, uh, we would like to make understand to our employees, uh, my colleagues who are working for, who they are working for. That's the just small symbol, it's a symbolic gesture. But uh, me as an activist, I did uh, a few years ago a project called Festival called Together. Uh, we, are, we are having this beautiful UNESCO city, medieval city in the center of Slovakia called Banska Štiavnica, which is uh, one, uh, one neighborhood uh, completely populated by a uh, strong, like 400 uh, Roma community. And there is a road um, from a biggest city, very important road, which is going through this neighborhood. And I, I saw that every car going through this road is speeding in this neighborhood because of the fear. And so we decided to change uh, psych uh, psychological uh, perspective of, of this physical space with action, with event. And we are, uh, decided to organize a festival with the, with the Roma band and not Roma band. Uh, and it uh, was a beautiful two days event for three years we did it when when people finally have an opportunity to stop in this neighborhood to see the festival and finally visited the neighborhood and discovered there is not so bad it's not so dangerous and and that that, that was the nice example how small thing things can really move something and change something in this in a small scale of course super thank you Raphael. By, by the way, bon appetit. Bon appetit. <laughs> food brings us together yeah, as well. So food, every time. Yeah, so so uh, I brought in, there is uh, an old example in Denmark, in uh, Copenhagen. It's called Superskillen. 30,000 square meters derelict, uh, derelict space of the city. Uh, activated out of an architecture competition by Bjarke Ingels and Topodeck. There was a landscape architect. And now it's a cool, vivid space. Um, and I believe the secret to make that happen was the contribution of the neighbors. That is the hottest area in Copenhagen with the most of um, foreign gain um, um, citizens of uh, Copenhagen, and also religious-wise, by the way, and they make it happen. And they got also the Younger Card Award in 2016. That's for me is an amazing example. Oh, it works today. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Didier, changing the question slightly, back to you. D can you tell us about your film and how it came about and perhaps some of the changes you're seeing and the responses you're seeing? Yeah, so the film that you have uh, seen uh, five minutes ago was realized by a citizen in one of the largest cities of the world, Sao Paulo, um, thanks to a festival that we started so five years ago. So the idea is to have from the voices through the eyes of citizens focused only on the largest mega cities, so more than 10 million people in a, in a, in a city, so meaning 38 cities in uh, 20, 24 countries. For example, China has six mega cities. In Europe, we only have three. We have Paris, London, and the last one is? <laughs> so it's an urban area in a Rhin Ruhr area in Germany, so we have three only mm. mega cities in, uh, in, in Europe. So in those uh, larger cities, we ask citizens to shoot by themselves something which inspire them to share with the world, with the other mega cities, and to, uh, to have them inspired. So this has been realized uh, three years ago by uh, Luca in Sao, pa Sao Paulo. And the interesting thing is when you ask to a citizen in those larger cities to uh, share what is very important for them. So for sure, depending on the year, you may get some different results. So we see more and more uh, topics around migration. Uh, people coming either internal migration in India, for example, but also from some other, from Turkish to, uh, to Europe. But al 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 every year we have quite a big contribution regarding people who are shooting the life in their cities. And what we, what we perceive has been one of the key uh, ideas is that actually they sh most of the time what, they are, what touch their heart is when they they use the space that has been built for some reason, and they reappropriate the space to do what they want about this space. So like under a big bridge, then they put some ropes, and they have the kids who are playing under a big bridge. 
So when in an old hospital, when it was kind of closed for two years, people come there so we, with social initiatives. So when really people at, uh, are at the center of an initiative to build their cities, and then when they are really actors of their cities, so that's one of the key uh, messages that those independent short doc makers share with uh, the communities. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I don't have an iPad with me, so I can't poll you digitally. So we're going to continue with the super low tech. I wonder if people could just shout out some cities they think are leaders in inclusion and togetherness, just to get a, a sense of the um, view in the room. Rotterdam. Yes, Medellin is, is often credited with being really innovative. Copenhagen, Barcelona, Tokyo, for what reason? Do you have a, thank you, do you have a view on Tokyo? Uh, I, want to, I want to share experience regarding to Tokyo. So I love Japan, by the way, I'm the two times a year. And one of our customer, we make a hackathon with the question to all Japanese corporates, what would happen if you would open up the ground floor to the neighborhood? So ground floor belongs to the neighborhood and not anymore to your company with art and an empty space. So these companies has done that. So they open up the ground floor around 1,000 square meters and now it's a vivid, vibrant co-working space. Every day, more than four to 600 people sign up, go in there for half an hour, an hour during commuting and make it vibrant. And what's so interesting that the, the, the co-workers of It's Yahoo, by the way, from the upper floors, they come down and drink the tea inside this community. That's a lovely idea. It's a lovely idea. I've also heard that um, Japan is being really innovative around bringing elderly populations in close proximity with the young, um, because aging is su such a big challenge for them. Does anyone else um, have a city they feel should be called out? So that Toronto. Uh, I, I think there are also cities that are particularly good in some areas. Vienna is often credited as being very good for women. Um, um, if I can, I mean, we talked about public spaces, we talked uh, about some uh, private issues, but, uh, and we're talking about inclusiveness, and I think that Toronto has some uh, really important projects that are going on uh, around inclusiveness, which is actually the, some re major revitalizations of our social housing stock. Uh, we had um, architecture that was not that well done, that was really about... Um, segregation and exclusion. So we had blocks and blocks of social housing, completely social housing, without any stores, anything with very high rates of crime. And uh, the city um, embarked in revitalization of these projects and uh, it's, it's quite interesting actually to look at the data. The biggest one is called Regent Park and we are now in phase three, so we're a little bit over halfway through. And uh, it, we now have a mixed income community with uh, facilities, with, uh, um, co uh, with uh, business going in there. And it wasn't easy, believe me. They didn't have a bank, they didn't have a store, didn't have any of these things. So uh, bringing the public spaces, the community organizations, the business to create the jobs in there, um, and seeing the impact that it has on the population, the reduction in crime, uh, the, uh, the um, impact that it has as a city block, and the school rates and everything is actually quite staggering. And I, we're always very, very proud of, of, that, of that work because I think it's, it shows how architecture by, you know, we had to bring back down all those buildings because they were closed communities. They were just turned into inside and now we opened up that whole part of the city and create really thriving mixed income communities with uh, incredible uh, public spaces. Um, I think it's a very good example of how the design can really have an impact on people's lives. Speaking 144 languages, is that right? 144 languages from 188 countries. Amazing. And, and fun fact, we have on our panel an award-winning architect who's also a mayor. Do, do you know of any other mayors who are also architects? Uh, not so many. That's right, not so many. But I, I think architects, we have this capability to put together many people and to make uh, 
forced in a good way people to make compromises because without the the involvement of different parties and people we are not able to build nothing so uh, i'm not the first architect who is using this uh, this capability to organize something or manage something so there are a lot of uh, architects who are uh, who are leading uh, some movement or leading some some project uh, even out of the field of architecture uh, i want often things are forgotten out of the past if you think in the in the time of the industrialization of europe all these industrial cities was community cities everything was there a kindergarten musician clubs uh, um, you can go swimming there are parks inside that was done by the way by the owners of the largest factories i grown up in these kind of areas but over the year companies have less responsibility to that and also the city by themselves have a misunderstanding what a city is. And I, I believe the, the, the biggest mess is cities are built for cars all over the world. If you go yeah. special to the new rising stars in China, they are not built for me as a citizen. <laughs> they are built for the cars, if they are autonomous or if they are on ordinary cars. So, so we've had some great examples of what can happen, um, even in unlikely places. Uh, I'd, I'd now like to turn to what are the main impediments? What are the things stopping more of this bold, innovative reform that we know works? And um, speaking for the empty seat in the room, I know what Anna would be saying, and hopefully she comes for the end of the panel, but um, she's particularly passionate about the um, privatization of public spaces. And it'd be great to hear from each of you what you think is getting in the way. Maybe um, Anna to you first. I think it's a balance that needs to be uh, struck. I think that um, uh, in Toronto, uh, we have uh, very strict rules about the private sector getting involved in some of our private spaces. I mean, we don't authorize advertisement or, for example, a private coffee shop to open in any of our parks. We don't uh, have any private business in any of our recreational centers. So we're very keen on that. However, for example, we have something that is called the POPs, which is uh, uh, private open, uh, uh, private open public spaces. Uh, and that is what sometimes there's the, when a developer is developing, uh, you know, uh, it's usually more than one building, it's two or three buildings. The uh, architectures and the conditions don't allow for that space to be public, for example, because there might be a garage under that public space and we don't want to take the liability and the responsibility of having, you know, to, do, to deal with that garage. However, we demand that the developer um, make that space available for the community. Uh, we demand that that becomes a public space. So I think these kinds of partnerships are really important. Um, the other example that I use is, for example, um, the Bentway, which is uh, a project that was just created in Toronto to activate a big portion of public land under a gardener, uh, under a highway. So imagine yourself skating and um, uh, you know, going to a park and in this case even having dinner under a gardener. And this was done through a very, very generous uh, donation of a private citizen and it's, it's now uh, maintained through a conservancy. Uh, so uh, I think some partnerships are important, uh, but again, I think it's maintaining a balance. Um, I think uh, we've been done, we've been doing, like I said, quite well because we have very, very strict rules into, um, you know, our public spaces and maintaining and even any of the advertisement. And I, and I think we need to continue to do that, but I think we, we need to be open to uh, the new realities as well. And is there anything else that makes reform, the reforms you would like to do, difficult? Um, it's, uh, people are resistant to change and, and I think that, um, um, it's, it's hard, uh, to, uh, sometimes, uh, manage, uh, especially for people that are doing policy and, and that are in, in, in politics, you need to, uh, push the boundaries a bit, but sometimes, you know, when it's, uh, you have, in, when you're talking about a lot of these, you talk about nimbyism, right? A lot of naysayers sometimes when you want to bring certain change, uh, you know, uh, we have very, very controversial debates when we want to install a bike lane in Toronto because people are so used and have that mentality that it's for the car and you're taking space away from my road for the car. Mm -hmm. And so it is, you know, the, it's, it's, um, 
uh, it, it's not easy for human beings to change and it's how do we uh, communicate and have that dialogue with people, understanding where they're coming from. Uh, yeah. I think not trying to dismiss their concerns but actually trying to understand and coming to a common place. I think it's really important. But the resistance is change. Sure. I think it's, it's, a, it, it's problematic, of course. Fantastic, and we'll get a little bit more into that um, inclusion of citizens. Anna, welcome. Um, I Hi, apologies <laughs> for my lateness. It's great to have you. Um, we are just uh, getting started on, I think, a question that you will feel strongly about, which is what are the impediments to the kind of inclusive innovation we want to see in cities? Yeah, well, again, excuse me for being late, and I'm sorry that I don't know what you've already discussed and if I'm going to be replicating uh, any material you've already discussed. Um, I've written quite a lot about the privatisation of public space, uh, particularly in British cities, uh, where actually nearly every new development over the last 10 to 15 years is on this entirely privately owned privately controlled model, which I would see as having been imported actually from North America, where in North America these places are called POPs, privately owned public spaces, <laughs> which you may have covered already. I, I prefer not to use the acronym POPs. Because sounds cuddly, doesn't it? It sounds kind of cute, and it doesn't really sort of... It, 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 I think it, it obscures really what's happening, which is a transfer of ownership of the public realm into private hands. So what you see happening in these privately owned places actually is that a whole range of uh, behaviours and activities are restricted uh, or banned, ranging from the sort of seemingly innocuous rollerblading, skateboarding, cycling, uh, even eating and drinking uh, in some areas to uh, filming and I think critically political protest uh, which to me indicates that these are not democratic spaces and also homelessness uh, and begging and this as I see it is very much a North American model although I think common to Atlanticist economies generally I think you see quite a lot of pops in Australia New Zealand um, and I would see it really as the built environment reflecting uh, social, economic and political realities. Um, so I don't see POPs as anodyne. I see them as actually a sort of critical uh, litmus test uh, uh, with regard to what's going on in our politics uh, much more broadly and actually an essential litmus test for the health of our democracy. Anna, you wanted to come in? Yeah, I, I wanted to comment because I think that balance that I talked about is really yeah. important because I think uh, you're, you're absolutely right when you talk about a lot of the limitations that the POPs ha have. In Toronto, we use POPs in the very, very last resort. Again, when there's probably a garage under you and you don't want to take the liability. But um, our city planning department is very keen on making sure that uh, that we don't get POPs and that we get true public streets and public amenities. However, we have, um, as part of our development charges, we have a park dedication, a public park dedication that a developer has to make. Either in land, after a certain size, we actually get the land, or we get uh, uh, cash in lieu, where, which the city then uh, um, uses to get uh, public land. So what we do push really hard. So you can have pops in there or not. We use it more as a design because sometimes we need to have that as a design. And if there's no other option. But we do have the tool, <clears throat> which is actually in jeopardy because our provincial government just launched some regulations that might reduce the amount of parkland, but I think that's where it's important. It's, it's, we actually require land or money so that we can buy the land so we can continue to have that public available space. And it's extremely, extremely important. Thank you. Didi, I'll come to you a sec, but, but Anna, just to go back to you quickly. So presumably POPs are a response to cash-strapped municipalities. What are the solutions when cash is short that aren't POPs? Well, I mean, municipalities in the UK are facing enormous cuts, over 40% cuts across the board. And you could say, 
given such a tough climate, given that social services are in such a terrible state, given that public libraries are being closed all over the place, given that we're losing so much, surely this is quite a good way to maintain the public realm. But I'd say actually that's very much like saying, surely, you know, this democratic feature of public life and the public realm isn't something that really we should be tampering with. Um, I don't see it really as an issue of a huge amount of money. Um, you know, for decades and decades and decades, the private sector has been happily investing in cities without uh, local authorities giving over control of streets and public places. So, I mean, the way I see it is actually the private sector would continue this investment, but local authorities who don't have to spend vast amounts of money on doing this are actually abrogating some of their essential responsibilities. And I mean, I don't, I, I, I don't think it's something that we can just sort of say, well, you know, they don't have enough money, you know, that's, that they can just let go of that s essential responsibility. And I think there are examples of um, civic crowdfunding that includes the private sector as a donor without ownership being the quid pro quo. I mean, I think it depends how you see local government and it depends how you see, well, democratic government in, in, in municipalities and, and more broadly. If you look across Europe, this type of model is far, far less common in actually fiscally constrained uh, environments as well. You know, look at Greece, for example. You know, the whole idea of streets and public spaces going over to this type of private sector management and control would be total anathema yeah. in Greece, where that public culture and public life is just sort of part of the DNA of society. So I think it's something that's crept in. And in the UK context, you know, it's been embraced with both of the partners, the developers and the local authority, actually equally keen to promote it. And there's been no break on it. But actually, you know, the odd development, which does escape, and, you know, there are a few that I do point to, they're not incredibly expensive. They're not very difficult to maintain, but it's a different model. If I if we're actually having this discussion in Toronto, because like I said, our provincial government, who actually has the Planning Act, is making some changes uh, to the way that we collect development charges and uh, is uh, questioning, uh, you know, all the development charges that we uh, use to pay for the growth on our libraries, the growth on our parks. They call it soft costs. And I think this is a fundamental principle looking at the issue. Um, I look at this issue as you need to build communities and, and in order to build communities for people to succeed, you need to have these services available. It's not good enough to just build housing and housing. They're, they're, the excuse to do this is actually to bring the prices of houses down. But you need to set people up for success and communities up for success. And in order to do that, you need public spaces where bring bring pub, uh, uh, the community together where people can get to know each other for safety reasons, for connection, connection, connecting reasons. Uh, you need libraries for, you know, education to integrate uh, uh, newcomers as well. To, so these are uh, part of growing a community and how you build a community. And I think that um, if you don't look at this this way, you start putting the idea that it is okay not to have it or not to invest on it or to have somebody else being responsible for it. And I think as municipalities, we have to fight this as much as possible because that's not the right way to build cities. And, and it's as, as you say, it comes back, to you mentioned development charges. We don't have development charges at present. We've had a long running discussion about land value tax, which may or may not come into being. That would solve actually these problems very, very easily. And it's got a lot of support, but not really politically. Um, our system at the moment of giving back, where developers give back some of those profits from speculative development is very, very weak. So that's, again, another of the push factors. It's interesting how the challenges are coming out as often soft challenges, narratives and norms, rather than hard challenges, like just being about the money. Didier, you wanted to comment, and perhaps you could also comment on Anna's earlier point about um, people being resistant to change and how storytelling might help unlock that. Yes, uh, I wanted first to, um, to, to bring a comment to the table regarding so the private public and some kind of hybrid uh, way to, um, to um, 
to bring value to a city that we have been associated with uh, in Paris, where the city was giving the possibility for some new entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs, to uh, build a new business model. Um, and it was also by taking into account the value of the services they were going to provide to the communities. So they had to be also uh, with the real business model, but the city was also giving some points to the ones who were, go who were going to bring some social values in addition of the pure business. So the land was given to, it was a kind of a call, f call for projects, and uh, you have several pure private who were answering and some kind of a hybrid social uh, business who were also uh, responding. And the city who was giving the space for free was the one with a democratic way to analyze the various project, to give the, um, the project to the ones who are sustainable in, 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 in the long term with some business, but also with the value on the social side. I, I'm so glad you raised that. And I think um, in general, if you, you know, public sector procurement, $8 trillion a year, um, right now, it's spent very bluntly. Um, it's not usually spent to achieve government's policy aims. It's often just um, parceled out on a minimizing cost basis. And I think there's a huge amount of opportunity in, in that too. Um, just back t to the, the challenges point, um, Raphael Matas, do either of you have comments on what gets in the way of doing more of the things we should do? In general, what I, what's missing, especially in the old world, is a long-term perspective. City development is still like, let's make it happen. It's a five years plan. If you go to Singapore, they have a 30 years plan. They make, I think, more than 200 square meters, 200 square kilometers uh, uh, redevelopment land from the sea, but they have a long distance plan for the entire city. And they also know like work is changing. They know, they know, know the uh, city district will change the face because people are working longer, longer. So what they try not to do is to make it much more vivid to bring it home into the city of the city center in Singapore. And um, we are faced with so many challenges in the future, especially also how people live. Think about the shared space. I was at Airbnb and there was a lot of large American companies who do project development in the United States. And then I asked the guy from Airbnb, what are they doing here? They believe if in 10 years from now, their asset is not a shared space, the asset has no value anymore. And they have no idea what is a shared space. And that are the things. So the people who are sitting on the table, often they have no idea what happens in five or 10 years from now. And that is a challenge. Maybe, maybe I will bring the discussion to a different scale. Uh, somebody already mentioned it that if you are talking about challenges, let's talk about political challenge because uh, we are politicians. Yeah, I'm, I didn't play with this word. I'm, I'm okay with that. Even if in uh, my uh, my countries, it's today it's not a, not a very positive word. It's, uh, it's very people have bad understanding of it. But anyway. And of course, on the on the um, on the uh, bigger political scale, we s scale we see this crazy rise of populism in Europe, and it's in, uh, it infected. Also, my country is infected by that. But I'm I'm kind of missing these old old school mayors who were were uh, in past able to to do the the, the bold decisions. We I'm trying to now the, my first uh, the big things I'm, I'm doing after six months as a mayor, uh, the, the most difficult things, uh, which is uh, parking regulation. So everybody's going to pay for parking more, and we're trying to change people's lives, which is the most difficult thing. We, we're trying to say, that, say to them that they, don't, they, don't, they cannot use cars as today, and, and, it's difficult and, and it's difficult for me to find uh, the, the, the real, uh, the, the people who will support me because it's it's just a tough decision and 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 as a po as I saw it before and now I'm in the role of politician but sometimes politicians are just losing the the, the 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 there is a blur between what is right and what is good for them or what is easy for them and this is this is how uh, where I see the problem of of uh, many cities and of course we have participation which is uh, for me is one of the the, the main main points 
also of my campaign, also of how I feel, what are my values in the city, how bring people, more people to the table, but in a, in a, in a real way, not in a formal way. Uh, but it's still, it's very difficult to put it together and make the bold decision which uh, is able to move the city forward. That, that's, that's my problem. Thank you. So I'm so pleased you mentioned populism too, because there's, there's an irony in this conversation. We're talking about um, cities, um, but a lot of the populism comes from the places that are left behind by cities when people move to cities. And this is a slightly unfair question to put to you because it's a bit off topic, but I think we should discuss it, which is what are some examples of how architecture can be applied to the communities that are being deserted in the course of urbanization to stop that sense of isolation um, and the populism that comes with it? I mean, for me, in my kind of narrow UK perspective, which might resonate a bit with North America, um, I think actually it's quite a similar question because when you create these very large scale privatized city centers, which is what we've seen in Britain. So for example, the center of Liverpool is now dominated by Liverpool One, which is 34 streets, 43 hectares in the heart of Liverpool. It's a high end, expensive shopping center. Liverpool is one of the poorest cities in the UK. So that's been created as a regional economic destination. It's exactly the same in Bristol, Cabot Circus in Bristol. Um, the aim is to get consumers, essentially, to come into these places from the much wider surrounding region. They may come in on a motorway, they'll go straight into an underground car park, they'll spend the day, they'll go shopping, they'll go to the cinema, um, you know, they'll, they'll do all sorts of things. They'll go back into their cars, leave Liverpool or Bristol, or whatever part of the country it is, without having touched the place in any way including financially and, and, and socially and culturally. And those surrounding parts of Liverpool and Bristol and other British towns and cities are completely left behind. So it's actually part of the same model that I'm talking about. These public-private partnerships that create these private parts of the city also fail to trickle down and they create the left-behind areas where populism thrives and that's a, that in a nutshell I think that that is what's happening in in Britain thank you Raphael so any idea for these Liverpools what they do when retail is dead um, well yeah I mean there is actually an alternative that we can talk about because exactly the same uh, was planned for Preston which is another city in the north of England, a town or city, I'm not quite sure, apologies to Preston, uh, exactly the same large scale private center was planned for Preston. It was going to be built by the developer Lendlease, which has built an awful lot of these around the UK. And it was gonna have the usual John Lewis and et cetera. And then following the financial crash, the numbers didn't stack up and Lendley's pulled out and Preston didn't know what to do. They were in complete crisis and they came across what's known as the Cleveland model, which is a model much more based on local procurement, local partition participation and it's actually very much leading the way as a sort of beacon which is of great interest to the um, current um, Labour uh, shadow uh, opposition in, in the UK and it's a very different model which has generated actually substantial economic returns so I think through local procurement and I might not have all the numbers at my fingertips but through uh, totally different procurement policies favoring only local suppliers actually 200 million is being invested in uh, Lancashire, yeah. uh, Lancashire, which is uh, the region. So it's a very, very different model of economic development. And it's one which has really grabbed the attention mm. of UK policymakers. It doesn't actually come from the UK. Again, it comes from North America, but it's a different approach to e uh, regional economic development. And I'd say that's actually where we should be looking at the answers with regard to uh, much more inclusive participatory ways of doing things. 
Um, super. So, so now just to get a sense of the room, who here, I imagine the majority of you live in cities, who lives in a small town or a rural area? Wow, just a handful. Um, over the next 10 years, who feels optimistic about the trajectory, the path of cities? Okay. Um, who's not sure? Who feels like vehemently pessimistic? Okay, there are a few people not participating here. Um, who feels optimistic about rural areas over the next 10 years? Okay, few people believe in a, a renaissance in rural areas. Who's not sure? Who's really pessimistic about rural areas? Okay, pretty even, even spread. Um, I'd like to come back to the question of how how we involve citizens and give citizens a sense of ownership in these solutions. Um, it seems that to give legitimacy to anything, there has to be um, a voice for the citizen in that. Anna, would you like to start us off? You've already, you've already mentioned um, incorporating citizens' views, but are there, any, um, are there any other tactics or approaches that you think we should uh, explore more? Um. So I, I have lived experience of uh, uh, having projects uh, succeeding the most when there is clear participation, direct participation from citizens. Um, I mean, I, I've done playground uh, renovations where I have kids picking up whatever uh, um, playground equip equipment they want. We do charrettes to have them. And, and people take ownership of those spaces like uh, nothing else, nothing I've seen before because they feel like it's, they own it, they participated in the process. Um, so I, 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 think, I, I think it is crucial, it, it is uh, really important for the success. Uh, but I think as a policy maker, uh, I also feel that uh, the, the um, most success I got into change some of the things that uh, we needed to push through and, 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 be a, and do a bit of a mind shift, um, actually started from the outside. When uh, um, uh, I, I pushed hard to have laneway housing in Toronto, so, so you know uh, a lot of our city is done um, uh, on a, like I said on a two-story uh, uh, single-family homes, and uh, we need intensification. And uh, a lot of people are saying, you know, towers is not the only one. We need to uh, diversify uh, the kind of intensif intensification. So uh, we started looking at the opportunity of ha creating rental units on top of people garages and so uh, laneway housing. Other politicians had tried it in the past and people were very resistant and staff in inside the city was very resistant. It was when I started with the civic organizations outside City Hall, when I started working with the nonprofit, with the residence groups and when we brought it inside City Hall there was already a movement created and when even some of my colleagues wanted to create some opposition to it, you know, there was an outcry. How can you? It's about time we do this. And, um, and I find it that as politicians, it helps us move things forward if we actually engage the citizens and as early as possible because they help us move through. They help us push for some of these things that need to happen or things that need to be maintained or need things that need to be fought for. That's really interesting. One of the things we hear a lot um, from our members and apolitical policymakers is that if you build that coalition at the beginning of stakeholders, it also critically helps you when a project might flounder later on, which often they do at the implementation stage, and gives the politicians who are leading it the ability to forge on rather than being tripped up by it. Um, any other good examples of involving citizens in cities? In Germany, the city in the north is called Bremen. Good football players, but the city economic-wise is not so brilliant. A high unemployment rate, and they get now in, in the city district, the developer makes the decision to hand over the developing process to the citizen. So he starts an, it's called idea workshop, or idea, ideen workshop in German. And what was surprising, for an entire week, it was packed with people, young, old, all genders, it was amazing. So, and day by day they collect the ideas and out of these ideas they make now the kind of briefing what should happen inside that area. And that is amazing. So now the architect, it has a more, the, the road book, 
and say, please um, execute the ideas. Yeah. Anna. Um, yeah, and I think there's lots of really great examples like this. I mean, I've I've heard about you know Finnish example where uh, planning departments and officials have their contact details easily available and they communicate directly and plans are open and you know there's lots and lots of great examples and I think we know how to do it but part of the problem for the sorts of things I've written about actually the conversation is a little bit upside down because a lot of the opposition to schemes which are going ahead in the UK you know, is arguably very justified. And the issue is that the consultation is very often seen as a con, you know, and it's actually about smoothing over residents' opposition in the face of their homes being demolished or, you know, some huge privatised scheme being uh, opened, which, you know, they won't be able to afford to go to. So it's, it's quite a sort of, it's a complex area. And, of course, we all know how to do it, I think, properly when you know, actually resident participation is, is what residents want. But very often, I think participation processes are open to abuse, and they certainly are in the UK. And the role of lobbyists and PR companies working, in developers, working with developers is a huge part of all of this. I think also the issue is that we don't give the public space an economic value. The public space has in the future an economic value for the city. For it is GDP relevant. And if you think about that, then we would be much more critical with this kind of it's like a production factor because you create serendipity out of that. I, I would say that is exactly what is happening, actually. Public space is being given economic value. Economic value, above all, it is being seen as a product. And that is leaving the s citizens out. And perhaps a narrow economic value yeah, through where, the lens. Where, yeah. where the citizen is seen really primarily as a consumer. So citizen participation is only as good as its design if it, it has to be sincere? I would say so, yeah. yeah. Um, and it's a very contentious and complex area. Yeah. I think people pick up on it so easily. People can really sense. On the insincerity. Oh, um, yeah, I've, I have a lot of development uh, going on in, in the area that I represent, aside from chairing the planning department. But it, um, when you walk into a room and they can sense right away if the developer is there just to check the box or if he's truly meaning uh, to engage the community and listen to them. People can pick that, pick that up in a second. Matt, did you want to come in? No, I I'm completely agree. I'm, I'm completely, the, 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 there is, you can fake many things in architecture in the city, but you cannot fake the honesty, you cannot fake uh, the realness. Uh, people are always able to, to feel it in very few seconds where you walk in, I have a very fresh uh, experience. Now I'm having this tour around Bratislava. Bratislava is, is uh, 600,000 people, uh, inhabitants, has uh, 600,000 inhabitants. And now we are doing this tour and I'm uh, explaining this parking regulation, this parking policies, you know, to people. And it's of course a very difficult topic, and, but I'm standing there three hours and talking to uh, angry, angry crowds. Uh, but they can feel that I'm honest, that I really mean it, and I'm really listening to them. So all these meetings becoming, in the end, a very nice democratic process where everybody listening, I have all my colleagues always with me, which is listening to people, that they are able to discuss, they are able to listen to us. And that's very important, and that's, that's, that's the, the problem with participation, that if it's just the fake, it's just instrument for something, it's just the formal process, it's destroying everything, the trust, the, the democracy, and, 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 uh, and uh, the, the, the emotion in the city. Uh, let's, let's use this word, emotion. Yeah. Uh, one, of, one of my favorite examples is of what seems to be very sincere participation is from the state of Bhubaneswar in India, where there was recognition that cities really weren't working for children, so they involved children in identifying the most dangerous parts of the city. Uh, and that was so successful, they subsequently created children audit committees. So new developments are overseen by kids. Um, but I also appreciate the risk of 
of those bright and shiny policies um, obscuring what can be important vested interests. Um, I'd like to turn now to the audience to um, put some questions to this panel. Any question you would like on, on the broad topic, uh, the lady over there in the black jumper. I hope there's a microphone, but um, can you maybe stand up and project? Interpreters will not be able to hear. Uh, sorry. Hello. So first of all, thanks for this very interesting panel. I'm Katarina. I work here at the OECD on civic engagement and citizen participation. And I wanted to um, pick up on this topic because we are talking a lot about consulting citizens involving in design. Has any of your cities have you ever thought about projects where you actually hand over public spaces to be managed by citizens, a, a collective, and associations? So it's really going beyond consultation, but to have them co-create and even co-manage uh, public spaces. Thanks. Thank you. Did you? So we have, uh, well, like I mentioned, the conservancy of uh, the Bentway. So that is, uh, uh, it's now a, a full charitable organization. We do have in Toronto as well something um, more related to our parks. Um, it's not formal yet, but it's uh, the friends of. So we have very friend, lots of friends of parks groups and a lot of them um, uh, contribute to how the park is run. They help us run the park in terms of uh, what needs to be fixed, what kind of programming, um, you know, what's going on, how can we plan for the next 10 years of the park life. Uh, and they, and they, we, we take them in consideration. Uh, some city councillors more than others, I have to say, because it's not something that is fully official. Um, but it is, it is active. And some of our recreational centers also have advisory councils. So they're fully integrated on how we run our recreational centers. Some of our arenas have arena boards. So they're run by citizens. So it's city arenas completely run by uh, citizens. So they have management boards and uh, they're appointed by council. And then we have business improvement areas. So this is uh, areas that uh, the business owners partner with the city and uh, they elect their own board and they have a budget that is cost chaired by the city to do streetscape improvements, uh, um, capital work in the in the area, beautification, mural projects, uh, festivals. And so that is totally run by, uh, by local boards as well. Fantastic. I would like to have business in poor area in Bratislava. We, we need to push a le legislation for it. And they started in uh, Canada, no? That was the first. They started. That's, that's a fantastic example how to, have to make a better city. And we, we, I was, before I uh, was elected mayor, I, I was a part of an uh, NGO called uh, Association for uh, Alliance for Old Market Hall. We have, in the, just in the middle of the city, we have this beautiful big uh, old market hall which for the last 10 years was just empty because for the city was quite a problem to use it. They, they made some reconstruction, not very good in 90s, just after the, the revolution. And so we, with a di different, uh, this quite big group of people, we, we were able to rent it from the city. We were uh, paying one euro per year, but investing 10,000 euros a month to the, to the building. And that was a five years ago. Now I'm, now I'm on the other side. Uh, but uh, there is an absolutely successful project. Now it's uh, open nearly 24-7. We, we, there are a lot of, of course, market every Saturday. That's the main thing. Uh, there are a lot of concerts, events. And the, 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 what is very important, there is a square in front of it. And uh, we work now. The, I, I need to use the day work. <laughs> on, 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 on the project uh, for the square, how to make a revitalization of the square, and it's just fantastic and everybody loving it. So I'm a very big believer in the bottom-up movement. I'm very big believer in the, in the active citizen who can change the city. And that's also a very big part of my plan to completely open the gate to everybody who, who is, is smart, is able to really deliver the, the good results and want to help the other city. That's very important. Just, just to um, dig in a little bit to this point about you, so you've been a mayor for six months, is that right? Yeah, that's right. And what's been your biggest lesson um, from going from the outside, wanting cities to change, to being on the inside? Uh, 
it's the, the big lesson is that the, the the city and my colleagues, my old colleagues that are now they are my colleagues, they they don't have, there is no trust uh, towards uh, or with uh, with uh, these people from outside. A small example was this, the same NGO uh, they were preparing the same NGO were preparing uh, the direct, uh, the the this direct, uh, the new project for Square. They wanted to make a competition architecture competition, very important square, and very close to the to the old city. And uh, and I, when I became mayor, I decided I hired these people. So they became my colleagues, and they're and they're doing it for the city. And there was this situation where we we're in the room, and the the the, the original original uh, employees of the city were still acting like these my new colleagues that we still are activists. So I, 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 there was a few moments I need to step up and say, no, no, I'm the city right now. So if I'm saying that we want this competition and we are going to change the square, I'm not an activist anymore. I hope you notice it. You need to do that right now. So, so that was it's still very difficult, but I'm going to do everything I can to put these two words together and to make a good collaboration. Co cooperation. Just on the issue of trust, there's been some interesting work around participatory budgeting and how if you do that in low-income areas, it um, dramatically increases trust. But? But? There's, there's, a but. there's, there's, about. Also, there's also a concern of um, having uh, people that usually participate more on these things taking over the, pro the process. So we're actually piloting it in Toronto and we're coming across these. Uh, the, and how do, how do we manage that? Because we really want to see it through, but we want to make sure that uh, it's not going to be yeah. sidetracked by one specific group, that it is inclusive. Um, pop quiz, does anyone know where participa participatory budgeting originated? You know? Brazil. Brazil. Now, in, now in, I think, 2,000 locations around the world. Been incredibly successful. Do we have any more questions? Um, Sorry, See, Anna wants. Okay, I'm going to come to you in a second, but let Anna quickly. Oh, no, come I was just going to come back on the business improvement districts because I couldn't let it go because it's one of my interests. Um, and I do see business improvement districts as interchangeable with private estates and private parts of the city. I mean, they're not democratic parts of the city. They're the ultimate public-private partnership in as much as the local authority gives the go-ahead. They might have one or two members on their boards, but as has been said, they are run by local businesses. It's local businesses who are responsible for all the decisions, and they run the area in their own image and their own needs. So they're consumer spaces, they're policed by private security, there's lots of CCTV. Well, they are in the UK anyway. Oh, not and in Toronto. all the <laughs> restrictions on behaviour and activities that I outlined apply in business improvement districts. Certainly in the US, I don't know if Canada has a different model. But just very quickly on your question, I don't think you were talking about that type of community intervention. You were talking more about community ownership or, or, of places. And I think that comes back to your point. Um, I think th th there is lots of good work being done in this area in the UK. But again, it tends to be the same people who run the same kind of places. So that does mitigate, you know, you'll get a lovely old Art Deco cinema being restored and that will be a wonderful community space, but it does mitigate against places that really, really ne need that investment and resources, having it directed towards them. Thank you. I just want to make yeah. clear that in, in Toronto, so at least, we don't, we don't have any privatizing. I mean, they, the, the business improvement areas, um, they're the businesses on that geographic area, and they, vary, they have a limited mandate. Uh, all the services are municipal services. Everything is licensed through the city. Everything is done through the city. Um, it's usually around festivals, bringing the community together, a beautification of the streets that has to obey to all the city standards. Um, but all the rules and regulations apply for the city, so there's no privatization at all. It is very much a consultation on how to use that pu public space and a working together with them. Great, thank you. Lady opposite me. 
Um, hello, I, I work at Clipier, uh, which is a big uh, landlord owner of shopping malls in Europe, uh, uh, having over 100 uh, malls in Europe. Um, my question is uh, about two things, about the use of digital media, social media, um, and collecting money from the people through uh, their personal interests. Uh, first of all, when you see Notre Dame uh, Cathedral, how many people have, you know, are giving, you know, spontaneously because they feel uh, very, you know, touched uh, by this, uh, you know, thousands of years building and they want to be part of it. So uh, taking another example, much more, uh, you know, a little example, but I know that uh, Jardin des Plantes in Paris has, uh, at some point, they had an idea that you could put your name on a bench uh, in the Jardin des Plantes. And also, when you see all the lockers that you have on the bridges of Paris, you know, all these people who you just, you know, say they're in love and just, you know, putting the lockers. All these ideas j just come to me that people are very attached to places and to your ideas about people, you know, loving their parks and being part of it. But actually asking the people to give in exchange of, you know, a service, an ownership, something like that, you know, engaging with people in that regard. And, and of course, to do it and uh, do it, uh, you know, uh, nowadays, I think the, the social media, the digital tools, uh, we're starting to use them quite a lot in the malls. And I was wondering, uh, I, I don't think I heard you talk about that, but, you know, if these two areas of thinking is something that you are considering. Like so, um, like I mentioned, we're very careful with um, um, corporate donations, uh, and uh, we do use the name, the benches, but usually it's in memory of, of somebody. Um, we do uh, use trees as well, but again, it's usually uh, people that want to uh, uh, put it uh, in memory of somebody. Uh, we have programs, however, for example, of adopt a tree, uh, because sometimes, I mean, we don't only need the money to plant the tree, we need the work and the maintenance to upkeep that tree. So in a lot of parks, we have neighborhood residents associations that have adopted a tree or business improvement areas that adopt a tree. Uh, so that's a way to involve uh, residents as well. We do have, um, you know, through our hospital and uh, nonprofit organizations, all those models. So you have always the donor wall and lots of donations of families, and we do that, have that. We don't have it so much in the city facilities. Um, maybe in our libraries, you're starting to see a little bit some of rooming names uh, and so on, but we don't have a lot. But we do have, for example, a program that it's Arts in the Parks, that it's a summer program that brings arts into uh, all four corners of the city, and that is funded by the mayor's arts ball. So it is mostly corporate sponsorships that participate and the whole city council usually attends and it's to fund uh, over a million dollars that is spent on these arts programming and, and, and promoting the, uh, the, 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 the parks. Um, and it, it works well. But I think we always try to keep the, the balance because uh, like I, I've mentioned here before, we do not allow you know, naming rights on our parks or recreation centers or on our public spaces. We don't. Uh, don't, we're not there. <laughs> Hopefully not soon. So rightly, um, trees and green space keeps coming up. Um, who here thinks their cities has enough green space? Okay. Um, for those of you who don't, please raise your hands. There should be lots of hands raised. Uh, who would be willing, of those of you who don't think there's enough green space, to s pay slightly more taxes to get it, say, 0.5% more tax. Okay. Probably about 50% of those who think we need more. We had some more questions over here. Yes, sir. Not yet. Now, yeah. My name is Toshev, I'm coming from Bulgarian Parliament, where I'm working as expert. But before, I used to be a member of Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe for many, many years. And I would like to draw uh, your attention on uh, one specific bottom issue. This is amelioration of grey zones in, uh, in the cities. In Europe or in the world, there are many grey cities where the people living, uh, just sleeping there, they are not acquainted with their neighbours 
stare, usually frustrated, and could become dangerous for the society in, in special circumstances. And uh, in this debate, which uh, took place in the Council of Europe uh, several years ago, uh, raised the issue that it's good to use one model, which was have been implemented in Germany and France and several places, where the people living in one particular building of these gray zones could be bring together to discuss how to ameliorate, to, uh, to make beautiful uh, this building, uh, and they should decide this by themselves. This, it should be their own decision. Some architects could be present uh, discreetly around to give ideas, etc. but the decision should be taken by the inhabitants, those who are the mm -hmm. resident, uh, residents of, of this building. And in this way, for example, they could decide very cheap to, to place the same flowers on, on each floor of this big building, or to, to place a pergola near the entrance, or to plant some uh, plants around and they could value this because this is their own decision and this is the social mm -hmm. aspect kind of art therapy also this could make them uh, well happy of what they produce and the, the neighbors from the, the next street for example or next building could follow this example and the role of municip municipality is not to impose such a decision but just to promote it just to initiate to bring people together eventually to buy some coffee to, uh, coffee to, for those who are gathered yeah. together and, and not more. This is very cheap, but could produce uh, um, socially very great impact on, uh, on, uh, on the situation in this area, this disadvantaged urban area. And this was the point. You could find this report in the Council of Europe site, amelioration of disadvantaged urban areas. And I think this is a good idea. This is yeah. very bottom, bottom line. Uh, initiative, uh, civil initiative, and this is the point. This is not um, uh, architecture is on the second place. The first place, this is contact between people who are living there, yeah, and to bring them together yeah. to take such decisions on on uh, uh, amelioration of their building. That's this a lot. Thank you. It's a lovely example, um, and I think it speaks to this idea which is gaining traction at, of government as a platform, so um, enabling people to come together and make decisions. Um, gentleman over there has had his hand up for a long time. If you could just please make it um, brief because we want to wrap up five minutes early. Okay, Henry Ries and uh, Energy Franck Allemande, but on the basis I'm a German architect and town planner. Um, I don't know if you've heard that um, in Berlin, where the former mayor said poor but sexy, um, well, it has a special history as everybody knows. There are now uh, initiatives to disown um, every owner of bigger apartment groups. So what would our specialists think about that? There's always this given a very good example of Vienna, I'm not in the details, but is the public a better uh, owner than a private owner? And uh, they take it even further now, the uh, president of the Dong Young Social Democrats says um, everybody who owns uh, an apartment which is bigger than 65 uh, square meters should be disowned. Have another extra hour? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Two minutes. Um, I mean, this is a very complex issue. Uh, in, in Toronto, we have a vacancy rate of less than 1%. And so um, we, uh, and we haven't been building rental. So the last real uh, push was of rental buildings was in the 70s and 80s, and we've had very, very low uh, rental buildings. So it's, it's, it's managing that. Um, uh, we uh, had press our provincial government hard to have more strict uh, rental rules. The rental rules are done at the provincial level and ten tenant protection rights are done at the provincial level. We had pushed hard because we were seeing a lot of people being evicted to renovations, to having these big companies buying the buildings actually. A lot of the rental buildings that we had in Toronto were family owned and we're now seeing it being uh, owned by these multinational companies uh, and REITs and so on. So, um, But at the same time we need more rental to be built because we are and in an unprecedented growth in the city. We have 114 cranes up in the air, more than three or four cities uh, in North America together, uh, but we have a population growth of about 30,000. We'll be growing in a million people in the next 20 years, the city of Toronto. So how do we respond to that growth, to an incredible low uh, vacancy rate, uh, and to the challenges uh, um, uh, that, that we have with, you know, a big, um, 
um, commodification of, of the uh, of real estate. So how do we balance the, these? It's something that we're struggling in, in the city and in the country as a whole, to be honest with you. We're not the only Canadian citizen or urban center in the world that is facing these issues. Yeah, I mean, in London, we are building vast amounts of luxury apartments, but they're unaffordable to the majority of the population, and a lot of them are left empty. There's this phenomenon we call buy to leave. So, I mean, this has become a political hot potato, and there's a lot of uh, desire to tackle that. I mean, I don't know too much about the specific situation in Berlin, but I've heard that it's actually very big landlords corporate landlords in Berlin who are being targeted and certainly you know there's similar kind of desire in London but our municipal government hasn't taken any measures really in that direction I think Berlin is quite a lot more radical and the situation in London is also a lot more extreme probably one of the most extreme housing markets in the world for this type of speculative model and the empty properties and the luxury apartment building one thing that we started to do in Toronto was actually use municipal land to build more affordable housing. So we're actually maintaining the ownership of that land, um, but uh, creating affordable housing through mixed communities and, and rental communities. So they have to be uh, rental and they have to be uh, to have a percentage of affordable housing. And all the value of the land is to actually deepen the affordability and create the highest amount of affordable uh, on, that, on that land. Um, fantastic. So I'm going to hand over in a sec to all of you to just give um, your one systems change that you think would most enable architecture to be more um, effective at bringing us together. If you could wave a magic wand and change one thing, what would it be? Uh, just while you think about that for a moment, um, it seems that some of the themes coming out of this conversation, first of all, Toronto is the answer to all of the UK's problems, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> Um, secondly, citizens are key to, um, citizen participation is key to a sense of ownership and to making the right decisions and the longevity of projects and the success of projects. There's a caveat around um, the fact that this has to be genuine and not cosmetic. Um, it seems that uh, we feel the solutions are already known. It's not about the fact that we need bright ideas. It's the fact we need to um, do them more effectively. Narrative and storytelling and mobilizing people is going to play an important role in that. There's a big outstanding question, a lot still to be worked out around the dynamic between the public sector and the private sector. Uh, it seems that some, sometimes can work well, but comes with um, a health warning in many cases. So with that, I will start with um, Raphael. To begin wrapping us up, what is the one change you would make? So I would say provide a vision, and that leads you to everything. Thank you. Uh, citizen participation. I'd say reinvigorating local democracy through local economies, because architecture is no more than a reflection of economics and politics. It was, it was tough. But uh, as a politician, as an architect, I will say uh, public space. That's, I, this, I know that it's always answer, but I still believe that public space can really change the, mm, the city and the, how people are living in the city, even if uh, the rule of an architect is uh, sometimes is a little bit uh, in this narrative about the city is a little bit more bigger than it's, it is in reality, but public space you know, is, is the answer for me. Great. I think it's bringing people to the center of it, uh, designing for people and with the people. Super. What a lovely way to end. Um, big round of applause for all our panelists, please. <laughs> and thank you for all your participation. Okay, d'accord. Ouais. Ah, vous voulez l'importer, donc.